Today, our featured speaker is Dr. Roger Baldwin, a professor of cooperative extension at the University of California, Davis, specializing in human wildlife conflict. Roger conducts his research and extension program primarily in agricultural and natural resource environments with a special emphasis on mammalian species. He received his bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees in various wildlife-related programs from Kansas State University, University of Memphis, and New Mexico State University, respectively. So today we'll hear from him on the identification of mammal pest species and IPM tools and approaches for managing burrowing mammals. So I'll pass it over to you, Roger. All right, thanks. Get my presentation up here. If I could get a uh, verification that this is working real quick. Looks good. All right, uh, let's take off then. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about um, maybe some rodents that you're not normally used to to working with as much. Um, and these would be burrowing mammals that exclude rats. I'm not going to be talking too much about um, rats today, but if anybody has questions at the end, I can certainly do my best to address some of those uh, some of those questions. What are we going to talk about? Uh, well, uh, let's do a quick introduction into some of the different critters that I'm going to be um, discussing here today. And one of those is the California ground squirrel. I'm sure you're all familiar with ground squirrels. They're pretty much just about everywhere, it seems like. They are grayish brown in color. They have a semi-bushy tail. They also have a mottled or speckled type appearance associated with them uh, that you can use to help differentiate them from some of our tree squirrel species that are present. Now, ground squirrels are a social species, so we do find them living together in groups. That means it's pretty easy to see them out there on the landscape. The damage that they cause can be quite extensive and quite varied. It does include girdling of vines and trees, so even though they're ground squirrels, they do climb up in the trees sometimes and they'll feed on the bark and cambium layer. Uh, they chew on irrigation lines. Um, their abundant burrow openings cause all kinds of issues. If it's on a hill slide and you get water, a heavy rainfall event, that water can channel down through that burrow system and call, hill, cause hillside slumping, some issues associated with that. Um, they certainly can be tripping hazards on parks and athletic fields, playgrounds, places like that. Um, if the burrow systems are around the base of the tree like they commonly are, and then you get a heavy um, rainfall event followed by strong winds that can lead to instability of the tree. The tree can fall over. Uh, so lots of potential concerns that we have with ground squirrels. Now, ground squirrels are a diurnal species. That means that they're active during the daytime. Again, that means it's pretty easy for us to see ground squirrels out there and know that they're causing problems. Now, as their name would imply, they do live in burrow systems. Sometimes those burrow systems are up and underneath structures, such as what we see in the top right photo. Obviously, that can be a problematic situation. They also like to burrow along um, the edges of properties, alongside fence rows, roadsides, places like that. So those are some good sites to look for um, when initially looking for ground squirrel activity in an area. That being said, once they become established, you can find burrow systems just about anywhere. We'll also spend a lot of time talking about pocket gophers today. And gophers are burrowing uh, rodents as well usually about six to eight inches in length. Now, as you can probably guess, gophers spend the vast majority of their life below ground. So for us to know that gophers are present in a particular area, we have to look for some form of sign associated with the gopher. And the typical sign that we're looking for are their mouths. This photo in the bottom right is a typical representation of what a gopher mouth will look like. Oftentimes they're horseshoe shaped in appearance, with a plug towards the lower end of one side of that mound. Now contrast that to mole mounds, such as what we see here in the bottom left. Mole mounds tend to be more conical or volcano shaped in appearance with a plug either right in the middle of the mound, or sometimes we simply don't see a plug associated with that mound. So those are um, some key diagnostics to tell the difference between these two. And it is important that you can differentiate between moles and gophers as they're quite a bit different species. Um, 
Gophers are rodents. They feed directly on plant material. Therefore, they tend to cause quite a bit of damage. Moles, however, are insectivores. They're eating worms and grubs and things like that. So they oftentimes aren't causing direct damage to the plants themselves other than through their tunneling or mounding activity. Also, the tools that we use to manage moles versus gophers can be quite a bit different. So it is important that you can tell which one you're dealing with. Now, as far as damage from gophers is concerned, probably the most common form of damage we see is their direct feeding on the tap roots of plants, which can weaken and or kill those particular plants. Now, if we're talking about um, woody plants, you know, trees, vines, shrubs, things along those lines, they can also girdle them below ground. And that's when they're, uh, again, feeding on that cambium layer of the, um, of the tree or the vine. And if they go all the way around that tree or vine, that will lead to direct mortality of that particular tree. And this is a particularly difficult form of damage to deal with because it's occurring below ground. So you don't know that it's occurring until you start to see a loss and vigor in that tree or vine. But at that point in time, it's probably too late. Um, if you see um, that kind of a response by the tree, um, then, then probably that tree is, is going to succumb to that particular damage. And if we see it to one or two tree or vines out there, there's, there's a good chance that it may be happening to a lot of them. So we can see pretty substantial losses pretty quickly from this kind of damage. <clears throat> Their mounds also cause all kinds of issues as well. Uh, they can kill some plants directly just by burying them. They create weed seed beds, basically. You know, when they're bringing that soil up to the surface, that soil oftentimes contains a lot of weed seed, and so we can see a proliferation of weeds associated with gopher mounds. They also cause um, uh, potential you know, tripping hazards as well. Uh, I love this far side comic <clears throat> that I think clearly illustrates you know, some of the potential concerns. Uh, certainly, there are tripping hazards on parks and athletic fields and playgrounds. You know, there's lawsuits, a number of lawsuits every year brought forward by people who are injured uh, uh, by, by gopher mounds or ground squirrel burrow systems in a lot of these areas. So it's a major concern there. Uh, we do see increased soil erosion again from water channeling down through those burrow systems, et cetera. So lots of potential concern there. We'll talk a little bit about moles today too. Uh, I did some basic introduction into to moles and, and comparison between moles and gophers, um, but it's important to remember that moles are um, not rodents. They're insectivores. They're quite different from rodents. You can tell that just simply by looking at this photo of a mole. You know, they have these large broad feet on the side of their body, pointed snout, very small eyes, um, these are predators, you know, they're constantly looking for worms and grubs and, and things along those lines. Um, because of that, they typically cause less damage than gophers do. Um, but they certainly can cause damage uh, through, through some of their tunneling and mounding activity. Uh, we mentioned uh, typical um, uh, factors for identifying mole mounds, uh, the general shape where the plug is at. I also will look at the consistency of the soil. Um, oftentimes with mole mounds, there tends to be larger clumps or chunks of soil associated with it versus gopher mounds, which tend to be more um, fine soil associated with it. So various ways that you can use to, to help differentiate between the two. Also with moles, you'll, we will um, frequently find these raised linear ridges. This is where the moles are foraging just underneath the surface of the soil. And when they do that, they push up that soil and you get these raised ridges. They're the only animals out there that will create those. So if you see those raised linear ridges, that's another good way to let you know that you have moles present in a particular area. The last animal that we're going to talk about today is the vole. Um, metal voles are sometimes referred to as metal mice as well. So if you're more familiar with that term, uh, we're talking about the same critters here. Now these are dark grayish brown rodents that are about four to six inches in length. So size wise, you know, think of a house mouse, think of a gopher. They're somewhat intermediate between those two. They're definitely larger than a mouse, definitely smaller um, than a typical gopher. Now, the real challenging aspect about voles is that their populations do tend to cycle. They can exhibit very eruptive growth patterns. So what that means is that 
you can have relatively low densities of voles for several years, and then all of a sudden when conditions get just right, those populations can really explode. And it can lead to a situation where you literally can feel like you are being overrun by voles. And this year happens to be one of those um, real peak cycles for voles. I've been getting emails and phone calls all the time this year about um, uh, this uptick in, in vole population. So it definitely does seem to be a real peak year for voles. Now, as far as you know, figuring out when you have voles, um, you're oftentimes not going to see them out there running around. So you're going to have to look for for other sign. Um, the, the sign that you're typically looking for are their burrow systems. Voles usually or always have open burrow systems, uh, about an inch to an inch and a half in diameter. So think back to gophers. You know, gophers live in closed tunnel systems where you have the mounds to identify them. Uh, voles have those open tunnel systems. They also have runways that go back and forth to connect those um, burrow entrances. And so those runways are another really good diagnostic to let you know that you have voles present. And we can use those runways to our advantage if we want to try to trap voles as well. And we'll talk about that later today. And as far as the damage is concerned, you know, they all feed directly on forage. forage. Um, if we're talking about um, trees or vines, again, they will girdle those. Um, vole damage, vole girdling damage usually occurs from ground level up to about six to eight inches or so above ground. Voles do not climb very well. Other rodents climb very well. Voles do not. So we generally don't see damage that extends much more than, let's say, eight inches or so above ground. A good diagnostic to, or let's say a general rule of thumb, that we can use to differentiate girdling damage between gophers and voles is simply to look at where that girdling damage occurs. For voles, like I said, usually ground level up to maybe eight inches above ground. For gophers, it's usually ground level below. Now, that's not to say that you can't get some girdling damage below ground from voles. Occasionally you do, but usually it only extends one or two inches below ground. And then they'll chew on irrigation pipes, uh, cables, things along those lines as well, just like all rodents do. So uh, now that we've kind of introduced the, um, the uh, critters we're gonna talk about today, now we're gonna segue into talking about some of the different management options we have for dealing with them. And before I start talking about some of those tools specifically, I first want to reinforce this notion that um, when it comes to effective management of burrowing mammals, it's really important that we think about utilizing an integrated approach. And of course, with an integrated approach, what, what are we talking about? We're talking about the use of multiple strategies. Uh, you generally will find much better success when you use multiple strategies than if you were to rely on any single one approach. So there's a, a variety of different tools, a variety of different strategies that we can use uh, to develop these IPM programs. Um, one example would be with, with gophers. Maybe you utilize raised beds to keep gophers out of particular areas. That can work really well. Occasionally, maybe one might find its way into that raised bed. Now you might implement trapping to remove that individual. So again, just stressing the importance of trying to mix and match these tools, that's going to give you much better results. Be sure you keep that in mind as we're, we're talking about each of these tools singularly, singularly for the rest of our time here today. So with that, um, let's talk about some of these control options. Here's a chart that gives you an idea of some of the different options that are out there for, for dealing with ground squirrels, pocket gophers, moles, and voles. Uh, you'll see that there is a variety of options. You'll also notice that um, None of these tools always work great for all of the species that we're talking about. So there are no silver, silver bullets for this. Uh, you will notice that some of the tools do um, have applicability for a lot of these different species though, habitat modification, trapping, exclusion being uh, potential examples of that. And we'll talk about them in greater detail today. You'll notice that some of them also have question marks. These question marks to situations in which, well, maybe they might work in, in some limited scenarios, but, but probably not over um, 
the wide breadth of, of different situations that we deal with. Um, baiting is another tool that we commonly utilize in certain situations for managing a lot of these uh, burrowing mammal species. Um, but I believe that um, there really are not hardly any um, toxicants available for these species in, in your guys' area. So we're not going to talk about those today. But if anybody has any questions at the end, I can certainly help to address any questions you might have on those. Frightening devices are another tool that you will sometimes see marketed for a lot of these different species. But there's really nothing that's been proven effective. Uh, for any of these species that would fall into that frightening device category. The last one I'll quickly mention, and then we won't talk about it anymore today, is shooting. Shooting is a tool that can be used to help control ground squirrel populations in certain scenarios. Um, but of course, we're talking about urban environments here, and you know it's, it's not um, generally advisable or legal to discharge firearms in, in most of these situations. So you know, shooting's probably a tool that's not going to be um, overly applicable um, for, for, for most of you. Now, that previous chart that I showed was no, by no means all inclusive. There's a variety of other tools that we can uh, utilize as well. One of the ones that's um, being talked about more and more is fertility control. Um, there are some immunocontraceptives that are available on the market for certain rodent species now, rats and mice being the primary example there. However, there is not anything available for gophers, ground squirrels, moles, or voles, um, at least not at this point. So it's not something um, that I'm going to address here further today. Biocontrol is another tool um, that's oftentimes talked about for helping to manage these burrowing mammals. Uh, with biocontrol, we're talking about the use of natural predators to help control pest populations. When we think about biocontrol, usually the poster child, if you will, that we think about for that is the barn owl. We tend to focus on barn owls for a couple of reasons. Number one, barn owls are very efficient predators of small rodents. Uh, one breeding pair of barn owls has been estimated to remove somewhere between two and 4,000 rodents per year. So they certainly are very effective predators of small rodents. Secondly, barn owls are relatively non-territorial. Why is that important? Well, it's important because that means we can put up barn owl boxes to hopefully artificially inflate their densities in particular areas so that they will spend more time foraging or hunting in that particular area. Now, the big question is, are they effective, right? And so that's been a question for a number of years. Um, however, it's been receiving more and more attention recently. Matt Johnson in particular out of um, Cal Poly Humboldt has been doing a lot of work along uh, this front. And some of the research to date has shown that um, they can be effective at um, reducing gopher populations to some extent. Um, keep in mind, they're not gonna get rid of gophers for you. Um, we're probably talking about a 10 to maybe 20% reduction in gopher populations uh, through the incorporation of, of barn owl boxes. Uh, but it is beneficial. It does provide some help and could be included as part of an IPM program. Um, we're still working on whether or not they can be effective for voles. I can tell you that if we're talking about vole explosion situations, the likelihood of barn owls being able to, to reduce those populations is, is quite low. But if we're talking about maintaining already low vole densities at relatively low levels, then perhaps there could be some utility. So um, there's, there's uh, continual work that's, that's being done on that front. Do keep in mind though, barn owls are of course a nocturnal species. Ground squirrels are diurnal species. So a lot of times people think barn owls might help with ground squirrel problems, but they're not because they're not existing in the same time scales there. So we can't rely on barn owls for, for any ground squirrel control. There are other raptors that predate on ground squirrels though, of course, including hawks, eagles. Um, uh, and so in those situations, individuals might try to put up raptor perches to encourage those raptors to hunt in those particular areas. But for a variety of reasons, um, we've really not seen any um, substantial impact of, of those raptor perches on ground squirrel populations. So I don't think that's probably a super effective strategy, but uh, barn owls uh, for gopher control, I think do provide at least some uh, limited relief. 
Habitat modification is another tool that we regularly utilize to help um, control uh, vertebrate pest populations. With habitat modification, we're talking about altering the desirability of an area for a particular pest species. There's a variety of examples that we can provide to, to showcase this. One of these um, uh, pertains to, to ground squirrels in particular, but likely to, to pocket gophers as well, and that's burrow destruction. If you think about it, if you have a ground squirrel population in a particular area, and you utilize you know, whatever tools you want to utilize to get rid of those ground squirrels, and let's say that you're 100% effective, you got rid of every ground squirrel out there. Well, that's excellent, but you still have those old burrow systems out there. And odds are there are adjacent populations of ground squirrels that are uncontrolled. And when you get rid of those ground squirrels, what's going to happen? Well, those adjacent populations are then going to quickly reinvade and take over those old burrow systems. So a predecessor of mine found out years ago that if you destroy those old burrow systems, that can dramatically reduce that reinvasion rate by 90% over the course of a year. Now, that sounds great. The downside is, is that this burrow destruction has to be pretty extensive. He found that you had to rip up those old burrow systems to a foot and a half depth. They initially tried one foot and that wasn't deep enough. The squirrels were still able to quickly find those old burrow systems, reopen them and repopulate. But when they got down to a foot and a half, that seemed to be deep enough. Uh, so it's not applicable in many situations. I understand that. But in scenarios where you can destroy those old burrow systems, that can be a really good tool for helping to slow down reinvasion. Another great example of habitat modification is simply removing brush or pruning piles. We see lots of brush and pruning piles in a variety of different landscapes out there. And these were uh, vertebrate species that might cause potential problems. Um, many examples of, of animals we're not talking about today, such as raccoons, possums, rats, rabbits, etc. But they're also great harborage sites for ground squirrels. They like to burrow underneath these brush or printing piles. And so getting rid of those uh, is a great way to reduce some of those preferred habitat um, areas. It also allows you greater visibility so you can see um, where some of that rodent sign may be. And then probably the best example of how habitat modification can be an effective management tool is for voles. Voles are a very cover dependent species. If they don't have cover, then they don't generally hang out in a particular area. And one of the most common forms of damage that we see from voles is girdling of young uh, trees or vines. So how do we go about reducing that damage? Well, one of the best ways is to keep a vegetation free zone for two to three feet around the base of that tree or vine. That's a great way to reduce girdling potential. If you can't keep those zones free of vegetation, then we do recommend that you keep the vegetation at two inches of stubble height or less. That's a pretty good way uh, for helping to reduce that um, girdling damage potential. What we don't want to do, though, is use a really thick layer of mulch or if you're in an area with substantial um, bowl problems, then utilizing weed cloth or some kind of weed barrier. Because in those situations, the voles will simply go underneath that weed barrier, or in this case, this straw, and now they've got this ideal cover, plus they've got abundant food in the form of the cambium layer of this tree. And so you can actually see greater damage in, in some situations where you utilize these kinds of, of structures or, or approaches for reducing um, potential problems with weeds. So keep that in mind. There's always a balancing act between um, all these different types of, you know, quote, pests that we're trying to manage, you know, whether that be weeds or vertebrates, what's good for one might be bad for another, et cetera. So we always have to keep that mind, keep that in mind and, and play that um, play that balancing game there. Another strategy that we can use to um, help mitigate potential problems uh, with these burrowing mammals is exclusion. Um, we've tried exclusion in a variety of different ways. One strategy that we've tried that hasn't worked is vertical fencing. 
Uh, here's an example where we were trying to keep gophers out of an alfalfa field. And we dug this nice two and a half to three foot trench all the way around the field and then put gopher wire um, down it and extended it above ground as well so that we could uh, keep those um, gophers that might be um, traversing above ground out of those particular areas. But I had a pretty good feeling right at the beginning that this wasn't going to work because look what we found right at the bottom of our trench. We still had gopher tunnel systems um, and lo and behold, yes, this kind of fencing approach did not work. And that was with almost three feet deep of, of vertical fencing. So vertical fencing, um, not a very effective strategy. But there are folks who will use horizontal fencing where they will fence off an entire lawn, for, an exa for example. That can be effective. Um, it's very costly um, and challenging to do, but but you can do so. Along those same lines, um, raised flower beds are, are a great way to protect you know, valuable plants that you might have, whether that's your garden, flowers, et cetera. Uh, these kind of raised beds uh, work really well. If you're gonna utilize raised beds, you do need to use the right kind of wire um, or wire mesh. We recommend um, for gophers, three quarter inch mesh tends to be ideal. Um, one inch is usually too big of a gap and a gopher can squeeze through that. Uh, so we don't wanna go one inch, usually three quarters inch is, is more, more ideal. You can sometimes get away with half inch mesh as long as it's relatively heavy gauge wire. But if it's thin wire, then the gopher can chew through it fairly easily. Also, if you're going to go through the effort of putting together a raised bed, I would definitely recommend that at a minimum you utilize galvanized wire so that it slows down that the speed with which it rusts through. Stainless steel would be even better, although obviously there's an added cost for using stainless steel. And then sometimes people will use wire baskets around the root systems of newly planted trees. Um, these baskets do need to extend above ground as gophers will get up above ground um, to um, move larger distances. Uh, so we do need that above ground exclusure, exclosure there. We'll also use exclosure um, to protect uh, certain plants from voles. Um, oftentimes we'll utilize trunk protectors around the base of newly planted trees or vines to reduce girdling damage. Here's an example in a production ag situation, um, but it's actually even more practical in urban landscapes because you have fewer trees usually to protect. The key with utilizing uh, these trunk protectors though, is that you do need to bury them below ground. Um, at least six inches, eight inches would be even better. If you just lay them on the surface of the ground, it's really easy for the vole to crawl up and underneath that structure. And now you've created the perfect environment for them where they have protection and they have an abundant food source. So you can actually see greater damage from voles if you utilize these trunk protectors improperly than if you hadn't used them at all. So if you're gonna use them, make sure you do bury them so you maximize that effectiveness. Now we've also looked at fencing to keep voles out of particular areas. Um, Again, I think as was mentioned early on, you know, most of my work is done in, in production ag situations. So a lot of these photos and a lot of my examples come from there, but they do apply in, in urban environments as well. And here's a situation where we were doing research on ways to mitigate damage in artichoke production down in Monterey County. And what happens is um, during you know certain parts of the year, these artichokes, they were perennial artichokes, but they would get mowed down and allowed to um, regrow. And when they did that, the voles that were in those fields would move out of there and into these natural areas. So those natural areas would serve as nice harbors for the voles until the artichoke fields grew back up again. So what we figured is that if we put some fencing along these natural areas, that could keep the voles from moving from those natural areas back into these artichoke fields once they reestablished. And that was very effective at slowing down that movement. Now it's not gonna completely eliminate it, but it does slow down that movement. So if you have areas where you have vole populations where they commonly move from and onto your property, this kind of fencing can be effective. 
It does need to be buried below ground at least six inches. Again, eight inches would be better, and it needs to extend above ground as well, um, preferably closer to one foot. They don't climb very well, but they do climb a little bit. So if you're utilizing something like wire mesh, they might be able to climb over that. We'd like to use aluminum flashing because that made a, a structure for which they couldn't climb over. Now keep in mind, fencing can be a good strategy to help reduce um, voles from moving into particular areas, but it's not going to get rid of your voles. So if you already have voles present, you're going to have to do something else to, to deal with that. Now, like I said, we utilize um, trunk protectors to help uh, reduce girdling damage from volts, but you can imagine that, you know, it's kind of time consuming and a little bit challenging and a little bit costly to utilize those. So what if we could do the same thing, but through the use of a repellent? So when it comes to repellents, there's a variety of different repellents out there. Um, they're marketed for most species. They don't work well for most of them, however, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, but there are various modes of action for these repellents. Some of them elicit a fear response. So think about predator urines as being an example. Some of them elicit a pain response, capsaicin, you know, the, the, the material in peppers that makes them spicy. Uh, sometimes that will be put on plants. There's sometimes there's bittering agents that are supposed to make those foods less palatable. And there's another class that are called these post-ingestive products that make the animal sick and then they learn to avoid feeding on them. So those are some of the different modes of action that are out there for uh, potential repellents. Unfortunately though, like I said, in most cases they have not proven effective against rodents. And if we think about it, it makes sense. You know, rodents have very short lives. They have high metabolism. They're constantly living in a landscape of fear. If they were afraid of everything out there, they would never be able to eat enough food to maintain that high metabolism. So they just kind of have to buck up and go after it, you know, in their life. So just because something tastes bad or smells like it's, a, you know, a, a cat urine or something like that, it's probably not going to be enough to deter them because they have to go about, you know, living their lives. But, um, we did do some work early on in a laboratory setting that showed that one of those post-ingestive products, anthraquinone in this case, was in fact very effective at reducing feeding activity for voles. And so what we began to think, well, what could be some real world situations in which we might be able to apply this? And so what we came up with was girdling damage from voles. Um, keep in mind, again, voles don't climb very well, so we realized that if we just spray the bottom part of these trees with anthraquinone, that might be enough to reduce girdling damage. And sure enough, in some replicated trial work, we found that anthraquinone was highly effective at reducing girdling damage. So that was pretty exciting news. We think it's something that um, could potentially be very effective to reduce vole girdling damage moving forward. However, don't get too excited. It's not registered yet. Um, it's going through the registration process. Hopefully it'll be something that will be available in the future. But it is one of the few examples of where a repellent has actually been effective at reducing damage from rodents. So stay tuned on that front. Um, sometimes you will hear um, castor being mentioned as a potential repellent for gophers and moles as well. I'll say it's really never been proven to be effective for gophers, so I'm not super excited about it from that perspective. There has been a limited study done on eastern moles in the state of Kentucky that showed that castor was somewhat repellent for moles there. So maybe it's something you could try. I say maybe because it's never really been, you know, tested for, for the mole species we have here in California. And it's important to keep in mind, you know, with repellents, although they may work in some situations, they probably won't work in others as well. Uh, it's probably very individual specific. It's, it, it relies on a lot of different factors. But just be aware that, you know, the castor um, repellents might have some utility for moles. I think it's a buyer beware situation there. Try it out and, and see how it works. You'll also find these vibrating stakes um, being sold a lot for voles and, and for gophers. I'm sorry, for moles and for gophers. 
Uh, but there's no evidence to suggest that those are effective. So personally, I would save my money and go elsewhere with, with our management tools. That takes us to trapping. Um, you know, there are certainly situations in which some of these species, you know, the populations begin to build up in a particular area, in which case you might need some tool to, to help reduce those, those populations in that in particular situation. And trapping is one of the uh, most effective tools we have for accomplishing that. Um, some ideal situations in which you might utilize trapping are when you have small populations of burrowing mammals. You also might utilize them at certain times of year when other techniques are less effective. A great example of that would be with burrow fumigation, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, burrow fumigants generally rely on high soil moisture to be effective. So if you're dealing with a time frame in which you don't have high soil moisture, um, then that's not going to be a, a good option for you. In those situations, trapping might be a better option for you. It can also be a good follow-up approach um, to alternative control methods. Uh, a great example, again, would be maybe you utilize burrow fumigation to initially knock down a gopher population and then follow that up with trapping to target some of those remaining individuals. Now, when it comes to traps, there's a variety of different kinds of traps out there, but they basically fall into two categories, and those are kill traps and live traps. Examples of kill traps include body gripping traps, such as the Conibear 110, box type squeeze traps, the common snap trap, that you might utilize for, for rat or mouse control or pincher style traps such as you know these gopher traps like the one you see here at the at the bottom, the Maccabee trap. These are all examples of kill traps and that they kill the animal after capture. Those are great when you not when you're not worried about non-target captures, but in many situations we are worried about non-target captures, such as you know, cats, dogs, um, other um, non-target wildlife. So if you're in a situation in which you are concerned about that, um, then you would probably want to focus on live traps instead. Common examples of live traps are these cage style traps, such as the have a heart or tomahawk style traps. There's multi catch traps out there that can be used as well. Of course, with these traps, the animal walks in, steps on the treadle and the door shuts behind them. And so they're unharmed inside of those traps. Uh, so they're really good to utilize in areas where you are concerned about those non-target captures. The downside of them, though, is what to do with the animal after capture. A lot of times people think that they can take the animal somewhere else and release it. But that is something that you cannot do. It is illegal to translocate wildlife in the state of California, and it's illegal for good reasons. Uh, number one, you know, the odds of translocated uh, wildlife surviving tends to be pretty low, so it's it's probably not going to make it anyways. Number two, you don't want to be taking your problem animal and dropping it off somewhere else where it might be causing problems for them. And even though you think you're taking it to this park and releasing it where it's not going to cause problems, um, what actually happens is, is these animals very rarely, if ever, stay where you release them. They usually try to find their way back home. They're actually quite effective at finding their way back harm, home, but even if you take them far enough away that they can't find their way back home, they're probably going to move a mile or two off of that property, um, where they then will take up residence and cause problems for others. But thirdly, and most importantly, the reason why we're not allowed to translocate wildlife is that these animals do carry a variety of different parasites and diseases. And these parasites and diseases are not ubiquitous across the landscape. In other words, um, you could be taking a ground squirrel that has fleas that's carrying plague, which is still found in the state of California, and releasing it somewhere else where plague was not present. And now potentially you've been responsible for spreading plague to that particular location. So it is important that you understand if you utilize these live traps, translocation is not an option. So what can you do? Um, well, basically you can release the animal upon capture at the site where you caught it, but why would you do that? I mean, you know, you're trapping them for a reason. Uh, so the second re option is to euthanize that target animal. Now, of course, if you're going to euthanize it, you need to do so in a humane manner. There are two techniques currently considered humane by the American Vet Association that would be appropriate for use for these kinds of animals. One of them is shooting. But again, if we're talking about urban environments, 
Um, it's usually not legal to discharge firearms there, so shooting may not be an option for you. So the other option in that particular situation is the use of a carbon dioxide euthanasia chamber, which is a device where you basically take the trap, uh, you put it inside. In this case, it's just a toolbox with a drill hole into the side, close the lid and pump carbon dioxide into it at a specified flow rate that causes the animal to pass out from that exposure, and then it eventually succumbs to that exposure. So if you want more details on this, I would encourage you to check out the Ground Squirrel Best Management Practices website that has more details on that, and I'll provide the URL for that at the end of this presentation today. So how about a little bit more specifics on trapping for some of these animals? Well, for ground squirrels, um, again, we talked a little bit about trapping um, and, and that it's a, a um, one of the great things about it is that it's effective year round as long as the animals are active. For ground squirrels, we do have to keep in mind that in some populations, they will hibernate in winter and over summer during hotter times of year, they will estivate. However, given the cool climates where a lot of you guys are, are hanging out, um, that may not be as much of an issue. You could probably trap at least almost year round for them. As far as different options, conibear traps are sometimes placed at the entrance of burrow systems, and then it's designed to catch the ground squirrel as it runs in or out. However, ground uh, conibears are an indiscriminate trap. They're a body gripping trap, and so you have to be very cautious where you use them. They're not generally used in urban environments. But if you happen to be in a more rural site, then they may be an option. Uh, tube or tunnel style traps are also oftentimes utilized for, for trapping squirrels, um, oftentimes set along runways. And then live traps are used quite frequently as well. Here's a great example of what um, one of those multi-catch traps look like. They'll allow you to catch or capture multiple ground squirrels at once. They, I always liken them to having a one-way pet door where they just kind of push themselves in, but then the door won't open the other way. And so you can catch multiple squirrels that way. How do we maximize our trap efficiency? Well, one of the best ways is to pre-bait. Pre-baiting is really important when it comes to, to trapping. What's pre-baiting? That's where you tie open the trap and then you sprinkle some bait inside as well as a little bit outside. What you're trying to do is get the squirrels accustomed to coming in and feeding in those traps. What you don't want to do is catch one or two squirrels on the first day and then have 10 other squirrels looking at their buddies caught in the trap and realize, eh, maybe that's not the greatest idea. So how we get around that is through this pre-baiting process where you get you uh, pre-bait for maybe five, six, seven days. Um, you look at the amount of bait that they're consuming when all of the traps out there are having heavy bait consumption. Now is the time to go ahead and activate those traps and hopefully you will catch squirrels in all or just about all of the traps that you put out there. And so that can be more effective. There's also a lot of questions about what kinds of baits to use. Um, there's a variety of options that can be used. There's no one magic magic bullet when it comes to bait. I usually start off with just plain old oats because it's the simplest and easiest approach. Um, but if that's not working for you, then you might try nuts, walnuts, almonds, pistachios, anything along those lines are my second preferred option. Beyond that, then you can start to look at a variety of different fresh fruits, green produce, even cat food in some cases, if they're really protein starved, um, can be an option for them. So, you know, feel free to mix and mash and, and come up with some options that work. Now there's another kind of trap before we um, move off of ground squirrels that I wanted to quickly mention, and that's the um, good nature uh, trap. Some of you may be familiar with the A24 trap, which is used primarily for rats. This is an automatic repeating trap. Basically the rat smells the lure up at the top, it sticks its nose in, it hits this trigger mechanism, and that activates this bolt, which is CO2 fired, which crushes the skull. It kills the rat instantly. It then retracts and it resets. It's called the A24 because you can get up to 24 captures per cartridge. So the great thing about these traps is that you can put them out there and forget about them for an extended period. In fact, this lure is supposed to last for four to six months out there. So they're really great from that perspective. There's actually a new design out there now called the A18 trap, which is a little bit larger, which is more ideal for squirrels. 
And so you could potentially utilize that for ground squirrel control as well. Not really sure how well it's going to work for squirrels. It's something that we may look at in the future. I will say that um, the efficacy of the A24 for rats is a little bit hit or miss. My personal experience with it, primarily in agricultural situations, is that it's not very effective. Um, the, the rats crawl all over it. They crawl part of the way up, but they don't tr quite get all the way up to the trigger mechanism. So it doesn't seem to be working as well. So, and, and they're really expensive. Um, you know, one trap and the whole setup, it's you know probably $180 or more. So they are kind of pricey from that perspective. But they're out there, and it's something that you could try. Of course, we regularly utilize trapping for gopher control as well. There's a variety of different kinds of traps out there on the market when it comes to gophers. In fact, a predecessor of mine wrote a book on all the different traps that were patented that's probably an inch to an inch and a half thick. So there's tons of different traps that have been designed over the years. Some common examples include um, box type uh, sque uh, squeeze traps like the Victor Black Box, uh, the Gopher Hawks, an example of a squeeze type trap as well, if some of you are familiar with Gopher Hawks. There's also pincher style traps such as the Maccabee, the Gophinator, the Cinch Trap, uh, the Victor Easy Set, uh, Johnson's Quick Set, uh, the DK1. Uh, again, there's a variety of different options that are out there. Of course, the big question is how effective are they? Uh, that's one of the big questions I always get, and we have done some testing over the years, in particular comparing these two traps, the, Ma uh, the Gophinator trap here at the bottom versus the Maccabee. And that's what this data at the bottom left is, is illustrating. Along the x-axis, what we have are different size classes of gophers, and along the y-axis are our capture rates. And that's <clears throat> broken down by the different trap types. The solid lines represent the uh, uh, results for the Gophinator trap, the dashed lines for the Maccabee. And what you see is that for the smallest size class that we looked at, both traps worked equally well. In fact, we captured exactly the same number of gophers when utilizing um, the Maccabee and the gophinator traps. But as we got into the larger and larger size classes of gophers, we started to capture proportionally more and more when utilizing the gophinator. And in fact, this relationship was almost completely linear. So what does that mean? Well, basically it means that for each size class up in size, we captured about 23% more gophers when utilizing the gophinator. And that compounded, so that 23% went up each time to the point where when we got out to the largest size class of gophers, we were still catching them with the gophinator, but no longer catching any of them with the Maccabees. So I do think that the gophinator is a really good trap and it's the trap that I've used for all of my subsequent studies. We also get a lot of questions about the importance of covering trap sets, or can we leave them uncovered? The basic um, premise here is that if you're covering a trap set, you're creating the illusion that there's nothing wrong in that tunnel system, so that hopefully the gopher travels up and down it just like it always would. Conversely, you can leave those trap sets open. That's supposed to encourage investigation by gophers to those trap sets because they don't like openings in their tunnel system. So come and investigate and try to plug that up and hopefully get caught. So we have looked at that quite extensively as well. And what we ended up finding out is that it actually didn't make a whole lot of difference either way. We did get slightly higher capture efficiencies when trapping at the hottest times of the year. So think, you know, um, late spring through, through most of summer. But that slight increase in efficiency was offset by the amount of time it took to cover and uncover those trap sets to the point where we were actually catching the same number per day, regardless of whether or not we were covering those trap sets. And we went to, when we went to cooler times of the year, we actually started to capture slightly more when utilizing uncovered trap sets. So in a lot of situations where I'm not concerned about non-target captures, I like to utilize the uncovered trap sets because it saves me that time and effort. But in urban environments, you're oftentimes worried about um, non-targets having access to the traps, and in particular, you know, kids or, or adults messing around with them. And so in many cases, it's probably worthwhile to cover those trap sets. And um, if you do, you'll certainly have good success. We've also looked at the potential to utilize attractants. Are there any kind of attractants that we can use to increase capture efficiency? Turns out, the answer is no, we don't really need attractants. Gophers actually are quite easy to trap compared to most other animals. I would far rather trap gophers than, than any other rodents out there. Um, I, I find that they're, they're pretty, pretty easy to, to catch. 
And then we've also looked at human scent. Is human scent, is it, let me put it a different way. Is it important to eliminate human scent from traps in order to maximize capture efficiency? Or can we handle traps with our bare hands, take our gloves off periodically to feel around in the tunnel system to see where the tunnels are branching, et cetera? This, these results were quite clear. Human scent had no impact whatsoever on our ability to trap gophers. So again, um, you know, I, th I think um, uh, gophers are, are just a pretty easy animal to catch. So we talked about some strategies that we could employ to increase the effectiveness of a trapping program, but we still haven't really talked about how efficacious it actually is. Turns out it's highly efficacious. Admittedly, these are agricultural situations, but I think they translate quite well to, to urban environments too. And you'll see that after two trapping sessions, what we had was 92 to 93% removal rates of gophers from these particular areas. And I might mention that, for example, in these wine grapes, we were talking about densities of 60 gophers per acre. So we're talking lots and lots of gophers, and we still were able to get rid of 92, 93% of, of the gophers in that situation. So it turns out the trapping is highly efficacious. Uh, so keep that in mind. I think it's a really good tool, a really important tool uh, for an IPM toolbox when it comes to gopher management. Um, I don't know that we're going to have time for this gopher video. If we do, I'll come back to it. Um, but I wanted to showcase um, kind of this trapping process because although I do think trapping for gophers is, um, you know, it's highly efficacious. I don't think it's it, it's particularly challenging, but there are still some tricks to the trade, so to speak, for it. And if we have time, maybe we can we can show that. So another um, animal that we can certainly trap as well are moles. Um, there has been a few studies done over the years on the efficacy of different traps and, and trapping types, et cetera, when it comes to, to gopher management. Unfortunately, I have never found a study yet that has actually looked at the efficacy of different kinds of mole traps. So I don't have a ton of expert opinion to be able to provide to you on mole trapping. But I have talked to several um, professional um, pest control folks that, that do mole trapping for a living. And what they generally find most efficacious are the scissor type traps, traps such as the Victor out of sight, or these body gripping traps, such as a smaller version of the gophinator uh, that's designed specifically for moles. There's a smaller version of this type of trap, or of a cinch trap for moles as well. But there are other kinds of options out there, including some choker style traps, um, these harpoon style traps you commonly see at stores as well. Um, most of these traps, when it comes to mole trapping, um, the way to set them is to place them down on top of the mole um, tunnel system. Usually um, you'll dig down into that mole tunnel system. When you get there, you'll put, you'll um, clump up a piece of soil, put that down in the bottom and then put the trap such as the Victor out of sight on top of that so that the trigger mechanism rests on that clump of soil. Then when the mole comes along, it will try to push through that. And when it pushes through, it will push up on that trap and activate that. And that's how they work. However, the body gripping type traps are set just like you would for gophers, where you dig down into the tunnel system, you put traps on both sides, um, and then hopefully we'll catch them that way. The one thing I will mention is that for gophers, um, usually trap sets are put out for 24 hours, and that's it. Um, gophers travel up and down their tunnel systems quite readily. If you don't catch a gopher within that time period, they're probably not in that part of the tunnel system anymore, so you're better served to pull those traps and set somewhere else. Moles, however, being predators, they have to travel much larger distances to meet their daily requirements by looking for um, prey. So that means with mole trapping, you have to be much more um, patient. Uh, it might take seven days or more for a mole to come back through that part of its tunnel system again. So do exercise some patience when it comes to mole trapping. Now, trapping, if you think back to that chart I showed early on of the different types of management options out there, you might re recall that I had a question mark underneath trapping for voles. 
The reason why is that bull populations tend to be too numerous for trapping to be effective. So here's a, an example of where we have lots of bull burrow entrances in a very short, small um, um, area. And then if we expand that over a large area, so in this case, don't think alfalfa field, think large park or something along those lines, you might have thousands and thousands of these vol burrow systems out there. How are you going to effectively trap those with snap traps? You know, probably you're not. But in some cases, you do have very localized populations of voles over a relatively small area. And in those situations, you could utilize trapping. That's utilized in a few different ways. One of the more common techniques is to take your standard mouse size snap trap and place it on one of those vol runways. What you do though is you place it perpendicular to the runway. So if the runway is going this way, take the trap and put it perpendicular so that the trigger mechanism is over the top of that runway. Voles do not like to deviate off of those runways. So because of this, you don't even have to put bait on the trap. The vole will just run over the top of it and can get caught. And that's really important because if you baited those traps, baited snap traps and placed them out in the open environment, there's a good chance that you would catch some songbirds or some other animals that way by having that attracted out there. And we don't want that. So by using an unbaited trap placed on the runway, is the likelihood of catching one of those non-targets is, is much reduced. So that's a better way to go there. Another option would be to utilize this approach <clears throat> where you can take a piece of gutter pipe and a couple of snap traps, in this case, with a nail stuck through the middle where you can stake them down into the ground so that when the um, trap activates, it doesn't fly up and pull off of, of the vole. But you can put it on both sides of a vole entrance and then put that piece of gutter pipe over the top of it so that it basically closes off the other two sides of that um, uh, burrow system. So it forces the vole to go over the trigger mechanism. So that can be a really handy tool for catching voles as well. However, if you're going to utilize this approach, you really need to get all of the burrow entrances covered. Uh, if you don't, the voles will just run in and out of that one entrance that isn't covered. So that's trapping. Um, we also have um, fumigation, which can be used to manage um, burrowing mammals. With fumigation, we're talking about the use of toxic or poison gases in burrow systems. As I alluded to earlier in the talk, soil moisture is really important when it comes to burrow fumigation. We need that high soil moisture to close off those pores and cracks in the soil so that it can hold those toxic gases in at a great enough rate for that approach to work. As those soils dry out, you get cracks in the soil, the pores expand, and now those gases dissipate much more rapidly and it just doesn't work very well. So, for gopher control, that means usually um, mid to late winter through early spring is an ideal time to fumigate. For ground squirrels, if they're hibernating in your part of the world, then you need to wait until after they emerge above ground. A lot of times people think that um, when ground squirrels are hibernating, that's an ideal time to fumigate because you know they're in the burrow systems. But reality is, is that when they're hibernating, they plug themselves up in a nesting chamber and then those gases can't get to them at a great enough rate. So you do have to wait until they're um, out of that hibernation period. It's also really important that you understand that fumigants cannot be used in or around buildings. How far away from those buildings you need to be depends upon the product that you're using. So always read the labels and understand uh, what those distances are. It may be anywhere from 25 feet up to 100 feet away from those structures. Um, but it's very important that we adhere to that because we don't know where these burrow systems go. Think about a gopher tunnel system. Just because a mound is here, you know that, that tunnel system may extend 30, 40, 50 feet in some direction and that that direction may go up and underneath the structure. So we do have to be cognizant of that and, and stay away from buildings because of that reason. Now, as far as our fumigation options, uh, we do have a few. One of those that's available are gas cartridges. Gas cartridges are essentially a glorified smoke bomb, if you want to think of it in those terms. You light a fuse, you shove it down into the burrow system where it creates a lot of smoke, a lot of carbon monoxide, which will asphyxiate the animal. Um, they work uh, pretty well for ground squirrels. Uh, we see on average maybe 70 to 75 percent efficacy for burrow systems treated for ground squirrels. Um, 
They are not effective, though, for, for pocket gophers. You will see a few different types of gas cartridges out there. Some of them are even called things like um, gopher bombs or, or something along those lines, which would imply that, you know, they're effective for gophers, right? But reality is, is they're not very effective for gophers. The gophers seem to sense that smoke pretty rapidly and just plug up that that part of the burrow system and move uh, move away from it. So we don't really recommend their use for gophers, but they are pretty effective for ground squirrels. Um, however, do be cautious when you utilize them. Um, they do have a tendency to flare up, so you can start fires. So you should have a fire extinguisher on hand, a shovel, etc. which you need the shovel anyways to plug up that entrance so that the gas uh, stays within that burrow system. Now, one of the great things about gas cartridges is that they are not a restricted use product. Um, so just about anybody can utilize them as long as you're adhering to the, the label specifications on them. Now, another borough fumigant option that's out there is aluminum phosphide. Um, some of the common commercial names are phostoxin or fumatoxin or weevilcide, which are tablets or pellets that you introduce into the borough system, which react with moisture in the borough system to create phosphine, which is a toxic gas. These are highly efficacious materials, but I believe they are not on your list of accepted um, um, toxicants that can be used. So I don't think that's an option for you, but if you want to talk more about it, I can answer questions. Another option that is available, um, which I think was being showcased early right before the, the, um, uh, the seminar started today, is uh, burrow fumigation with these pressurized exhaust machines. Now, there is a few different <clears throat> kinds of these pressurized exhaust machines that are available out there on the market now. And the first one that was available is the PERC machine. PERC stands for Pressurized Exhaust Rodent Controller. It's basically a small engine that creates exhaust, pumps it through coils to cool it off, and then stores it in a large compressor, from which you can then use a series of hoses and probes to inject carbon monoxide, or that exhaust, into those burrow systems. Another similar uh, device to that is the Kojak, um, which is available now. Uh, these devices have the advantage of, of allowing you to treat multiple burrow systems at once, so you can move through areas more rapidly, but they're also much more expensive. And so they're not necessarily applicable for everybody in all situations, um, but they but they are, are good for um, large scale jobs. Uh, smaller scale options include the Burrow RX <clears throat> and the Cheetah Rodent Controller. Uh, most of the testing that's been done with these over the over the last few years has been with the PERC machine because it was around first. And what we've ended up finding out is that with the PERC machine, it works relatively well for gophers. I'd say on average, we're looking at 60 to 65 percent efficacy. This isn't great. There's other tools that work better. Trapping is more efficacious. Um, and then some other tools that, that um, I don't think you guys can use, such as aluminum phosphide and strychnine are more efficacious. But as far as the tools that are available for you, um, it's pretty much trapping. And then, you know, these kinds of pressurized exhaust machines are, are probably your, your next best option. They also, again, have the added advantage of allowing you to treat, if you use these, Oh, sorry, if you use these larger devices like the Perk Machine and, and the Kojak, they allow you to move through areas far more rapidly. And we have data to show that you can treat areas much more rapidly with those devices than you can with a lot of other approaches. Um, as far as ground squirrels, we see much better results. We've tested them in ideal soil conditions where we had high soil moisture, and in those situations, we had 100% efficacy. But even in dry soil conditions, when most burrow fumigants do not work well at all, these devices still worked relatively well. We had 66% 66 66 efficacy in those dry soil conditions. So that's really promising and encouraging and suggests that you can even use them in situations that, that might not be ideal. I would still try to do most of your fumigation when you have these ideal conditions because you'll get much better results. But if you're really limited and, and need to, to utilize something during the, the dry period, I, I do think these devices probably work pretty well there as well. Incidentally, we did also test the cheetah rodent control machine, which is this um, modified leaf blower type device. You'll see that we actually had more ground squirrels after treatment than before treatment. So this particular device did not seem to work very well for us, uh, but the perk machine did work really well. Um, there's not been a lot of testing on these other devices, but there has been some limited testing and, and that limited testing along with the design of these devices would tend to suggest that their efficacy is likely to be similar to what we see with the perk machine. So I think these three devices probably work pretty well. 
this device not so much. More recently, we've also had um, the advent of carbon dioxide injection devices. Uh, the eliminator is an example of one of these where you use a canister of carbon dioxide to then inject that into the burrow system. Um, not a lot of data on efficacy of these devices either, but what I have seen and their, their general design would again suggest that they're probably similar in efficacy to these pressurized exhaust machines. The downside of them is that you do have to have this canister of carbon dioxide, uh, which means you have to constantly be replenishing that, which can be a bit of a hindrance. Also, because this is considered, because um, this is a compressed gas, it's considered a pesticide. That means you have to use carbon dioxide that is labeled as a pesticide, which is very difficult to come by. So that's a potential limitation. Whereas these pressurized exhaust machines are treated as a device and not a pesticide. Um, so there are um, some places and situations in which you can utilize these devices that you can't utilize some of these other fumigation tools. So keep that in mind as an added advantage to those pressurized exhaust machines. Um, I will also just quickly mention dry ice because sometimes people have questions about that. There is actually um, a dry ice product labeled for rat control now, but there's nothing um, labeled for go for ground squirrel bowl or mole control. So that's not really an option. The last thing I'm going to uh, mention are these gas explosive devices. I'm mentioning it primarily because people often ask questions. Um, these are devices that inject a mixture of propane and oxygen into the burrow system. It's then ignited, theoretically killing the animal through a concussive force. What we have found is that these devices are not overly efficacious, only 30 to 35% efficacy for both ground squirrels and gophers. So there's much better options out there, but they also have a lot of potential hazards. As you can see here, they're really loud, not applicable at all for urban environments. They are definitely a potential fire hazard. Here's an example of a fire that a colleague of mine set while um, testing one of these products years ago. So realistically, um, I think there's a lot better options out there than, than these particular devices. So that's the uh, material that I had uh, to cover here today. I did mention early on the Ground Squirrel Best Management Practices website. This is meant to be your one-stop shop for ground squirrel management. So feel free to check out this. It's groundsquirrelbmp.com. Pretty easy to remember. Lots of information on here, including calculating CO2 flow rate. Uh, for a euthanasia chamber. So look at that for more additional information. And I think most of you are pro prob probably familiar with the, um, uh, oh, I have the wrong URL here. Sorry about that. Um, the UCIPM Pest Notes. Um, just Google UCIPM Pest Note, ignore this one up here, and um, you'll come across uh, lots of great information about how to manage, you know, ground squirrels, gophers, voles, moles, et cetera. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions